everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, if you'll join me, I'll do an opening prayer. Dear Holy God in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. We ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit as we study your word. Give us clarity and understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, I know the board's not gonna, I don't think you can read everything, but I will take a photograph after um, the study is over. It's not gonna be a busy board. So I, I don't think it'll be too hard to follow with me. Um, and I'm trying to avoid the glare of the light. So I hope you, it's still okay um, to do it this way. So what I'd like to do um, is for us to look at the line of restoration again, um, starting with Eden, but in a slightly different um, perspective. It still will involve um, gender sexism and there will be a little bit more of um, patriarchy and seeing how that develops in the line. So we know the Bible is, um, was written by men and it's about men pretty much. Um, and that doesn't make the Bible our enemy and then, um, it's just that's how it happened. But we also are aware of that we know the true came first and that it's the true that is counterfeited and it's the true that is distorted. And because of the um, spin uh, in Eden, headship and submission was entered in and that of course was corrupted throughout the 6,000 years of history. And we know that it's the world that corrupts God's people repeatedly in, Bi in the Bible and throughout history. But we also have the assurance that God is always at work and he's making advances to restore his image in a people that he calls his own. So we'll begin with um, Eden and we have equality, and then sin enters, and then we have submission. And when you have submission, that means you have headship or ruler. We, we've also understood, too, that the when you look at patriarchy, it has a very dark side, and it's basically an ownership of women, and they are seen as less than, um, as less than men. So we keep that in the back of our mind. Now, as the story progressed, um, Eve, Adam and Eve, he, it says Adam knew Eve, and she had um, two sons. The first son was Cain. He is the firstborn, and that in itself has value in ancient Israel. The firstborn is always considered superior to the other sons. The next son is, um, of course, we know is Abel, is his brother. His younger brother.
So I was looking through <clears throat> different quotes and um, stories how Ellen White looked at this relationship between Cain and Abel. And she, this is in Patriarchs and Prophets, and she said that Cain hated Abel. So this is really shortly after the sin of Adam and Eve, and now their son is hating his brother. And in, this is his mindset. He thinks that his methods and his plans should have supremacy. So uh, here we see this uh, self-aggrandizement, um, um, a boasting of, you know, a superior pride. He was also unable, and this was, of course, over the topic of worship, but she said Cain was unable to force Abel to submit to his control. And he was provoked because his younger brother presumed to teach him. So we have the arrogance and pride here. Um, and this so enraged him that he killed his brother. And so now this short period of time, we now have the first murderer. So we have murder. And it's of a family member. So we see how quickly um, sin has degraded um, Cain. And he has... Um, He's even questioned by God and says, where is your brother? So, yes, this is the first murder. This is the first mention of murder. Um, we still, we, we um, even though Cain's life is spared um, and he refuses to confess his crime and then the earth is cursed a second time. Um, Ellen White describes him as his heart is hardened. His rebellion grows against God. He then becomes a tempter to others and violence spreads. And um, so the next family member that we don't usually look at is, uh, in this way, is Lamech, which is, I think, the fifth generation from Adam. And Lamech takes two wives. So now we have going from one wife, husband and wife, to now two wives, and the first mention of polygamy. And when you look at the words, it says he took two wives, he literally did, the, the, the def definition of the word means took, so they, he was, um, a, a, the women had no choice. Um, now, as the first mention of polygamy, we know that there's, um, it's based on um, a hierarchical ranking of men over women, and so a, a patriarchal polygamy often treats wives as little more than property, which why so many Bible verses um, for um, ancient Israel and, and even um, uh, pagan religions value the value of the woman's virginity is because that's their, she's seen as property. And if she loses that, either through a willingness on her own or she is taken against her own will and loses her virginity, she is now considered damaged property. And this is why the Levitical law had where if a, um, a young virgin is raped, that the man 
has to marry her because actually that's her own, her real lifeline is to be married. Now, sadly, who it, it's a strange rules back in that time, but um, when you see it as that is their only um, course in life is to be married and have children. And if you're considered damaged goods, there's shame, there's, you're considered a bur burden. So there, it's really a rough position to be in on either side. So Ellen White talked about the, the polygamy that happened. Um, and she said that, um, that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born, they took them wives all, of all which they choose. And this custom of polygamy was practiced after the flood and became so common that even the righteous men fell into this practice and had a plurality of wives. So this was the first mention with Lamech. Now, another thing Lamech did was that he killed two people. We have murder. And he killed a man. And the, it can be, looked at in the definition, it was definitely a young person, a youth or a child. So the first person he killed was a man and he was wounded in that battle of fighting and then he killed a youth or a child and was bruised. But the point is that there's, we see here, the two wives, two murders, violence is increasing, law, law Lawlessness is increasing. And he also boasted. Uh, Ellen White says that um, the people before the flood, they had great intellect that was perverted. And they also had evil imaginations of every type. So for a while, there were, we know there are two classes of people, beginning with Cain and Abel, and then it went to Seth and Cain. Um, and so they, for a while, lived separately. They did not intermingle. But over time, they did begin to mingle. And the, they, they married within each um, line of um, descendants. And so they, the children of Seth, became depraved like the children of Cain. And sin spread across the land. And God, it came to the point where God had to um, cleanse the earth. And of course, we know that Noah and his family were the only ones who were saved. So we want to move on to another part. We're going to come to, to Noah soon. But I'd like to take a minute for um, to look at some uh, a word definition. Does anyone know what the word euphem euphemism me means? It's we a use, word that is associated with a concept or an idea. Yeah, we use it all the time. And I'll give an example, and I'm sure, then you'll, you'll know what, what I mean. So when we say you're over the hill, what does that mean? You're now an old person. Um, oh, I'm between jobs. Means I'm unemployed. Um, oh, you're a little thin on top. Oh, you're going, you're, you're bald. So it's basically a mild or indirect word or expression that you substitute for one that may be too harsh or too blunt. 
um, when referring to something unpleasant or embarrassing. I know when I was, uh, I had gained some weight some years ago and I was telling my uh, sister, I'm like, yeah, I'm a little more fluffy than I need to be. So that was a euphemism. So, um, you know, I'm not fat, I'm fluffy. So um, it, it was a nice little fun joke and I didn't like it, but I, I knew I wanted to lose that fluffiness. So anyway, I want to give some examples of just a few from the Bible. So in Deuteronomy 25, 11, it, there's a phrase and it says, and, and he was take, he taketh him by the secrets. And so, of course, the word with meaning, you know, with, with the weight would be secrets. What does that mean? And that means the sexual organ body parts. Another one that we're all familiar with, Genesis 4.1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. We know what that means. And another easy one would be 1 Corinthians 15.6, but some are fallen asleep in the Lord. So we have euphemism, euphemisms in the Bible, and I, there's more than we realize, I think, but, um, and so we're familiar with some of them. And of course we use them in daily life also. So one other thing we want to keep in mind is that Mo, when Moses wrote the Genesis story, it was about, it was about a thousand years after the flood. And we also know that patriarchy was well established and Moses was a sexist, but we also then can see the euphemisms that he used because remember there was an oral history. People already knew these stories. He was merely writing down what they had already were aware of and had heard through the generations. So now we'll move to the after the flood and we come to Noah. Um, this is the 120 years before the flood and that's when all the intermingling and the increase of sin and things, um, that was their probation time before the shut door. Would someone um, read Genesis? Nine, 18 to 25 for me. You have your Bibles? We're going to need your Bible. You're going to need your Bibles. We're going to look at that a lot. Henry. <clears throat> Thank you. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted vine, vine, vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of the servants, shall be beyond to his brethren. Thank you, Lana. Okay, so we're just going to walk through this story because when you do a surface reading, it can be very confusing and we can um, inject our own understanding. There, there are a lot of euphemisms in this story. 
So we'll start with verse um, 18. And does anyone find it interesting that um, Ham is now announced as the father of Canaan at the beginning of the story? Does that stand out? Did that stand out to you? I thought it was interesting. I'm like, why? Why is he mentioning this? And as I was studying, there is a, a method of storytelling uh, in, of Israel. They, they, tell, they give you a clue or a hint at the beginning of the story about what's going to happen at the end of the story. And it sounds like something we're familiar with. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, kind of first and the last. So it's this is now being made a distinction for us to keep our eyes open to. Why did he say these things? Why did he mention Canaan and that Ham is the father? Because at this point, there are no children. When they, you know, they came off the ark. And um, so we know also that within these, this story, picture or keep in mind that um, there's time collapsing where you can have, um, like in, I think it's in Matthew, talks about Jesus being a baby. And then the next thing you know, he's 30 years old and he's out doing ministry and there's nothing in between from being 12 to the time he's 30. So that kind of um, thing happens here in Genesis 9. So the next thing is Noah plants a vineyard. So we know that that's going to take time. It has to grow. It has to produce the fruit. Now, um, then it says Noah drinks the wine and became drunk. So I, I looked into this and I'm like, why would Noah do this? So apparently um, the drinking of wine is closely related to sexuality in the Bible and in Near Eastern literature. And if you've ever read the Song of Songs, it is full of images of wine as a symbol of sexuality and the vineyard as a place of love making. And they also, the scriptures show that the drinking of wine functions as a prelude to intercourse. And that would be in chapter 8, verse 2 in Song of Songs. And also, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of David and Uriah um, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uriah refused to go home where he would drink and lie with his wife. And so David got him drunk in hopes that he would go home and enjoy his wife. So it never made sense to me why David got Uriah drunk. <laughs> I, I didn't figure that out. I didn't see that. So we can see here then that, you know, I think what Noah's 500 years old now. Um, I don't know what his virility would be at that time, but he decided to have some wine. So now the next, um, and it says he was uncovered within his tent. That has, uh, that is another euphemism. And when you look up the word, um, and he was uncovered, you'll see that, I mean, when you look in the Bible, it's four words, but in the concordance, it's only one word. There's only one number to point you to the Strong's um, concordance for the definition of those uh, four words. And so that number, that word number is H1540. He was uncovered. He 
So Strong's concordance says <clears throat> it's to denude. And then in parentheses, it says, especially in a disgraceful sense. By implication to exile, such as when captives were usually stripped when they were captured. So this gives a totally different <clears throat> understanding of what you might have thought, who uncovered who, and did he uncover himself? Did he, you know, what, what is this all about? So we're getting some more clues. Genesis 9.22 goes in again and mentions and Ham, the father of Canaan. And I looked up the word Canaan, and it means humili humiliated and properly to bend the knee, which then actually fits with the curse that's going to come to Canaan later. <clears throat> so we have two mentions now of Ham, the father of Canaan. Not and chapter, I mean, verse 22b, and it says, The father of Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Now, I, I'm, I'm wanting to say that this is a delicate, could be triggering um, subject as we enter in farther with understanding what happened between Ham and Noah. And um, so I just want to give that advance notice. I um, uh, hope it, you know, that it <clears throat> can give you warning if this could be a trigger for you. Um, so when you look up each word, you get different, you get the definitions, but it's when you look in the Bible using Miller's rule number five, that the Bible is its own expositor. So when you look up nakedness of his father, it takes you to Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 8. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. So this is describing maternal incest. And we're now seeing clearly how this was not a homosexual act between Noah and Ham. This was a violation against his mother. It goes on to say that then Ham bragged about his, um, and told this to his um, brothers who were outside, that were without, and that shows Ham is still in the tent because the word without talks about a separation of a wall. So he's in a tent, so that would make a border and Ham's on one side in the tent and the brothers are out here. And he's boasting from inside the tent to his brothers and the wall of the tent is separating them. So we see here now that the unnamed wife of Noah, along with the unnamed wives of the sons, are disguised and hidden out of view. And yet this is our common parents um, for this new earth, this new creation. And yet she is um, taken advantage of and is not even named in the story. So the brothers decide, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go in and literally see the nakedness. And so they literally go in, they go in literally backwards and they literally do not see her. Um, but if you see the, understand the euphemism, they also did not partake in the, um, the vile act that Ham did because of the, so it's a literal and a uh, euphemism 
to um, having sexual relation or literally seeing someone naked. So then we can surmise that when Noah woke up and it says he knew what his younger son had done to him. And this is where a lot of people want to say that it was uh, a homosexual act. But um, again, I would suggest here that, of course, he talked with his wife and he talked with his sons and they described what happened while he had been uh, passed out. So then when you think of the time uh, lapse between verses, she gets pregnant, it's evident what happened. And then this is where the curse of Cain comes in. Um, he, Noah is now cursing the product of Ham's illicit union and this would give the rationale um, because a homosexual act would not have produced a, um, a child. The other part of this that you can factor in, I believe, is the part of the patriarchal structure in a family. And that actually it was Ham's um, intent, um, it wasn't a lustful thing, that he was usurping the power of his father as the patriarch, and thus being over his, his brothers also. And there's other, there's other Bible verses that show, um, that that is true, and I have them later on, we'll follow up on. Um, okay, so there was a question about how there was a, it resulted in a child, um, because it was um, an incestual act, and twice before the, the description of, at the beginning of the story, father the, Ham, the father of Canaan, and then three verses later, Ham, the father of Canaan. Um, the writer wanted to make a distinction that it was not Noah's child, that his wife was pregnant with Ham's son, because we know it was an incestual um, act. Kathy? Yes. I have a question. So if, you know, not, not to go farther into the study than you're already at, but th does that implicate that Canaan himself, the mother of Canaan, would be, would then be um, Noah's wife? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's also a corresponding verse in Leviticus 20 verse 11 yes. that says, the man that lieth with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Yes. So that, you know, endorses what you're saying. Yes, amen. That's so great. I mean, that just really seals everything off. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when you go to the, the book of Leviticus, uh, the third verse, God is telling Israel that the things they saw and did while they were in Egypt, they're not to do. And the things um, that are happening in the land of Canaan, they are not to do those either. And then from the following verses, Leviticus goes in and it's a whole list of sexual relations that are prohibited to God's people. And so it's, it just fits in there that Moses is the writer. He knows the oral history of what happened. He knows the history of Israel and the corruption from the world of God's people. And he had to write these things down. So another thing, too, if you consider when knowing that the Jewish reader would have heard about, heard this story. And so they would know the history of 
the descendants of uh, Canaan, and they were an idolatrous, incestuous people. And even the gods that they worshipped were incestuous. Um, so this listing of Ham as the father of Canaan would totally make sense to them because they, they already knew the story. And, and, and also the, the maternal incest explains the gravity of Ham's offensive act because it's just so unnatural and so beyond the pale. Um, and so we know that Moses used idioms, um, euphemisms, to describe Han's transaction as the nakedness of the father. Um, and I, there's another verse um, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse, um, let's see, 17. To see nakedness and to uncover nakedness is the usual expression for sexual intercourse. And, and in Ezekiel, there is, and again, the, this is showing the dark side of patriarchy and the devaluation of women. Yeah. That is what we are keeping in mind here, that this darkness, this darkness, and even today, it is still so dark, whether you are a religious patriarch or a secular patriarch, there is a darkness to that that doesn't affect everyone, but it does affect enough men. Um, and, and even a spiritual headship is even just as dangerous because the woman would, doesn't want to um, displease God by not obeying her husband. So you can see the dangers here um, of power. Um, so there's plenty in the Bible that um, talks about these violent acts against women, and they are violent acts against women. And um, there's even in Ezekiel descriptions of, of, of sexual violence. And so it is a, um, I, I read where a, an author said that um, the patriarchal <clears throat> structure um, is the platform or the, it's what enables the slavery of women, which then easily transferred over to the slavery of men because they, it just grew their power. They, and, it, and we see that in the progression of, um, the story and how then slavery is possession, it's ownership, you have no will of your own. And this is basically what women lived in these stories in this time of ancient Israel. So we see the degradation. This is not God's original plan, obviously. And um, we have um, an active work that God is doing and showing in the world to free women from this slavery and to free men from the thinking of this way that is so socialized into us. We don't even realize how we think about these things. And they leak out in very easy, similar, uh, simple things that we, we just, and it's becoming, we become more alert and we can catch ourselves or we'll catch each other. Whoa, don't say that. That means, you know, and that helps us. Um, and when we introduce our spouses, we should say, this is my wife, Mary. This is my husband, Bob, whatever. 
You know, you want to give a name. We don't want to just say, oh yeah, this is my wife or this is my husband. This is my sister and don't give a name. People have an identity, uh, but we tend to kind of just stick with the role uh, or their position. So it's, it's a new way of thinking for us and uh, we can thank God for that. Can I just interject? Sure. Um, it's just so important, this study, because again, it's highlighting how this offense was against Noah and not his wife. As you said, she's not even mentioned the nakedness of Noah, but it's talking about his wife, so how unimportant she is. Mm. So, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing how, how little they thought of women. Mm -hmm. He offended, not her. She's the one that experienced that, you know, I can't even find the word, but it, the offense was against her, but she's not even mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this shows, you know, where it was written in the time of Moses. So that was another thousand years. So you know how strong patriarchy had come by then. Um, and then and the place of uh, of the of the woman. Um, and even patriarchy was so uh, absolute that you know the sons were under their father um, and all the children, everything belonged to the to the rule of the father. Um, so this is the things that we're uncovering and this is how these things get they they morph and not they're not so um um they're more the the patriarchy has morphed over time because you can there's only so much uh, like you know we don't have really blatant racism it went underground it morphed into more covert things or regulations and laws and you know, it was kind of hard to really pin it down. And same with the, the patriarchy type thinking and um, sexism, it's going underground. And so it's a constant battle. Um, Sister um, Kathy? Yes, or did I'm you sorry. say? Kathy, yeah, I, miss, I just misspoke. <laughs> okay, gotcha, Yikes. caught it. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to, you know, I'm just trying to interject without, without interrupting. And I know you're trying to read the feed at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I have a thought when it comes to understanding sexism at a level that, like you said, we innocently, and maybe it was apropos that I accidentally said what I said, because when you just suggested that we should introduce someone as this is my husband or this is my wife, even looking at where we're at today and what's going on and not even recognizing gender and looking at, at people who are in, in relationships, you know, um, you know, if, if you've got two women who are, who are in a monogamous relationship or two men in a monogamous relationship, then which one is the husband, and which one is the wife? Um, so, I don't know. Is it right for us to even say, you know, th this is this is my this is my life partner? This this is this is I don't know how to approach all that because I don't know where that fits into the bigger picture. That's my question. Well, we're not throwing out all gender. I mean, you know, I still have a, a, a biological sister. Uh, I still have a biological brother. We still have marriage. We have husband and wife. Um, my point is, if you want to, you know, if you want to express the relationship, don't forget to include the name of your wife or your of husband. Of course, of course. And some, you know, and and there's a lot of times that I know, even in our Adventist churches, you know, well, you know, my dear wife, this, and they never mention the dear wife's name. It, it's only she's now been renamed wife. Yeah. And and wives have done the same thing. Well, you know, my husband this, my husband that, my husband, my husband, my husband. And I'm like, what's his name? Why don't you just say, well, you know, um, Steve and I have decided instead of my husband and I. Just different things like that. Um, gotcha. And, and my understanding yeah. is in um, same-sex marriage, I believe they, if it's, and somebody can correct me. 
um, they call in, in male, it's they're both husbands. Right. And in uh, lesbian, they're both wives. Yeah. Okay. I, I was not aware of that. I just didn't know. So mm -hmm. um, my question is out of ignorance, but I appreciate the clarification. Oh, that's no problem. That's how we Thank learn. You. So there was a question about why was Canaan cursed and not Ham, and so I, I've got some more to go over, and I, I'm hoping then that will help to um, answer that question. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see. So historically, um, the Bible scholars and commentaries all know the, the origins of the Canaanites are, um, as, they are um, ascribed to the most um, serious form of incest. Um, which is between um, mother and son. The father and daughter is prohibited, but it was considered less serious. Why? Why would that form be less serious in this time? Because of the patriarchal system and intercourse between a son and the mother or stepmother openly threatened the patriarchal authority structure of the family or the clan. And this is, when I was, was reading this, I was like, this makes so much more sense of what Ham was actually doing. He had, a, it was like a double insult. Um, so let me share this here. We have, it says, um, so we can see then a son who has sexual relations with his mother commits a rebellious sin against his father, since the possession of a man's wife is also seen as an effort to supplant the man himself. Again, here we have ownership she's property. When seen from that view, it would seem that then that Ham's trans transgressive sexual act was an attempt to usurp Noah's patriarchal authority. And this can be seen in other stories in the Bible. In 2 Samuel, you can see where Absalom has public intercourse with his father's concubines, which are considered his wives, which are considered his possession. And then when David became king, he had the acquisition of Saul's concubines. So again, it's a power shift. Um, and and the, the conquered is the woman. She's the possession. She's the property that if you have her, then you have the man. And even Ezekiel rebukes his contemporaries for committing this kind of sin. So when you see um, Ham's maternal incest in the larger framework of ancient Near East concept of overcoming or supplanting a father um, or a man, by sleeping with wives, this makes Ham's act not primarily of lust, but one of, of a family power play. And basically the mother was just a pawn. And so this power play as an attempt to acquire the father's authority also circumvents the rights of his older brothers, whom he immediately informs of what he has done. So when you think about Canaan's name, it means humiliated and to properly bend the knee. This is what I'm suggesting that Ham did 
to his father and his brothers in that act. He, they may not have literally bowed their knee, but in a patriarchal sense, you know, there was a humiliation um, and there was a power play. And so to curse Canaan is to show that he was the result of an illicit act, that it was not, he was not the son of Noah. And because of Ham's incestuous act, the result has to, has to carry the curse. Um, and it, it's, and also remember a curse is a prophecy of what future events could be. And the actual bond, the um, being slave, a servant to the servants, didn't happen for centuries. Um, so Noah's sons weren't, I mean, you know, um, Shem and Japheth weren't even alive when that um, servanthood took place, uh, when the land of Canaanites and, um, were overtaken. So we see the overwhelming patriarchal system, but we see threads of silver of redemption in there when we can see lines. God is working to protect women in many ways. Our methodology is helping us to uh, see that you can't... Um, always take the Bible literally in all aspects. We have to have context and disposition, uh, dispensation um, factored in there. <clears throat> so basically, God does not hide these events even though he uses euphemism, so you have to dig to find out what happened. And violence against women and girls has its roots in a rape culture. And that rape culture, in turn, has its roots in a patriarchal worldview. Again, that does not mean that men with a patriarchal worldview necessarily harm women and girls. The vast majority do not. But the rape culture, which tells men they're entitled to objectify, take, and own women's bodies, can only exist in settings where men are seen as superior to women. Which you can see understandingly how now when women speak up about being violated, about abuse or um, harassment, they're not believed. And that's a long history because she's only a woman. She's emotional. She's trying to dig for gold, all this stuff. And it's just been hammered and hammered and hammered to show she has no value. And that's been changing. And we can see that with the hashtag Me Too and everything that's been exposed during our studies on the lines that God is working. He's doing a work. So it's when, you know, how to, will that ideology ever go away? I doubt it but we're fighting um, to understand it and to not let it exist in our minds and hearts. And so, you know, we know these societies around the world, men still have a far greater privilege. And so the rape culture still dominates. And there was a, a feminist biblical scholar. I want to finish with a quote from her that says, Noah's wife, who should have had an individual name and identity that goes along with her stature as the second mother of creation, 
is buried under indirect language of the nakedness of the Father. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and close in prayer if there's nothing more to say. Okay. Dear Holy God, we thank you, Lord, for so many blessings that you have given us. We thank you for opening your word to give us understanding, to see your active hand in restoring your people. We pray that we would be fit to enter into heaven. And we thank you for all the mercies you have given us. We thank you for the Sabbath day and ask for continued blessings. Pray this name, pray in Jesus' name. Amen.